everyone. Welcome. Just giving everybody a few minutes while the attendees roll in. Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's webinar entitled Nucleus Genotyping Using Crystal Digital PCR. My name is Kamini Chilvaraj, producer at Global Engage, and I will be hosting today's virtual event. Thank you all for joining us. A quick housekeeping rule, please post any questions you have at the Q&A tab and it will be addressed during the Q&A session. Access to the recording of this event will be emailed over to your registered email address within 48 hours post event. I would like to thank Stella Technologies for sponsoring this event and our speakers, Dr. Stefan Hackman and Yun Jae-an for making the time to be here with us. Yun Jae-an completed her undergraduate and master's studies in horticultural science in 2015 and 2017, respectively at the Kyungpuk National University in South Korea focusing on flower breeding of lily and hibiscus. She has a particular interest in chromosome biology research and its application for plant breeding. Jay joined the meiosis team in December 2017. Since this April 2018, she is an early stage researcher in frame of MAKEM, a Marie Sklodowska Curie Action Innovative Training Network. Together with the research group Chromosome Structure and Function of Andreas Huben, she aims to identify factors influencing the meiotic recombination landscape in Bali using single pollen genotyping. For, now for a quick introduction of Dr. Stefan Heckman. After completing his diploma studies at the University of Kassel in 2009, Stefan stayed on to complete a PhD with Andreas Huben at the IPK, receiving his PhD from the Martin Luther University, Hale Winsenberg, in 2013, where he investigated the structure and regulation of centromeres in mono and holocentric chromosomes. In 2013, he moved on to the lab of Chris Franklin at the University of Birmingham, studying different aspects of plant meiosis and plant meiotic recombination. In 2016, he was awarded a junior researcher fellowship from the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research to establish his independent research group, which he started in October 2016 at the IPK. Research in the lab focuses on the process of plant meiosis that generates genetic variation through homologous recombination. Dr. Stefan, the room is now yours. Okay, I will first share my screen. Let me do this. It should be visible. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. First of all, Kamini, um, many thanks for the kind introduction and also for organizing this event. And I would also like to thank um, Stella Technologies for um, yeah, asking us to talk about our application using their NICA digital or crystal digital PCR system. And in today's talk, um, myself, so Stefan Heckmann, and also Jun Jean, who is a PhD student with us. Um, we will tell you about um, an application using crystal digital PCR to genotype individual nuclei. And the specific application Jay was addressing was whether we can measure meiotic recombination rates in Bali polynuclei. And in today's seminar, I will give a very quick introduction about the research background and how um, yeah, we came into contact with Stilla and what um, was the or why we were interested in testing the crystal digital PCR system. And then in the second part, Jun Jian will tell about her PhD work um, using the crystal digital PCR, because she's actually the expert using it. So first of all, a quick introduction. Why is meiosis interested? Well, meiosis is a key event for sexual reproduction. And with this, uh, meiosis is a specialized cell division. That is basically two, uh, one round of DNA replication that is followed by two chromosome segregation rounds. And the significance of this meiotic cell division is twofold. First of all, it reduces the, the um, chromosome number by half, 
which allows after fertilization of male and female gametes to keep somatic diploidy. And second, it also assures genetic variation, which is basically the basis for all um, breeding processes, including plant breeding. And genetic variation is assured by so-called crossover events. So these are reciprocal genetic exchanges between parental chromosomes. So as depicted here, you have a pup and a mum chromosome. And then here in a cartoon, you can see that they exchange um, certain reciprocal DNA pieces. And then later on, you have individual haploid gametes. So every uh, gamete is different than the parent, uh, resulting in a variation in the offspring. And now uh, meiotic recombination, we are majorly interested in, in barley and, and cereals here at the IPK in Gartersleben. And uh, in case of meiosis, like for many other species, meiotic recombination is actually rather a bottleneck for barley breeding. So what is interestingly in most of the plant species is that we have first of all a very limited crossover numbers. And then when we check under the microscope, so we check the outcome of meiosis, so the chromosomes undergoing recombination, we only see these kind of donut shaped structures or we see like uh, such a what structure. So this means you have the mom and the pup chromosome only connected at the end, so only exchanging the terminal chromosome region, or you have it at both ends, so you result in a donut. But notably, this large proportion of the genome, like depicted here, they are rarely, if at all, recombined. And this really creates a problem for many breeders. So if you have interested trait in these regions, to really access them. And we in our group are really interested to study uh, what is the basis of this and how could it be altered. And to alter this, and to study, for instance, mutant or certain effects like Jay was doing, you need to be also able to measure recombination rates. And typically, uh, how you measure recombination is traditionally like, for instance, I depicted a very simplified example how a breeding scheme could be. So you have two different varieties, and here in green, you have depicted a certain trait. Um, which a breeder would like to integrate in, in a light material. And then you uh, generate an F1 hybrid. And then due to meiosis, you have um, mixing of these uh, parental genomes. And then the breeder selects. And then later on, he can come up with his light material and integrate this trait. And this is basically based on different molecular markers. So usually a breeder or as a we would use genotyping by sequencing approaches or molecular markers. And for this, we need large segregating populations. So we have to grow large populations of plants in the field. And the other way to measure meiotic recombination is to do it in a, for instance, a cytological approach, which is however very low throughput and is very laborious. So you can either check based on a chromosome morphology where the crossover is, or we can also use other cytogenetic techniques like using antibodies detecting um, so-called um, meiotic recombination protein that are basically located at sites where crossover are. And then in this example, he depicted his red dots would mark future crossover site. But this is really laborious and a very low throughput. So an alternative, which is more commonly used over the last years, also outside of the plant kingdom, is to focus on gametes. Why do you focus on gametes? Gamete is the direct outcome of meiosis, and they are haploid. And in a plant species, we have on the one hand pollen, and we have eggs. Pollen is, so to say, the sperm um, of plants. And why is this interesting? Instead of growing really large populations of plant, you could get basically from a plant tens, thousands of um, individual pollen grains. So you, you can basically focus on, on single or individual plants. And you don't have this laborious and time consuming and expensive detection of crossovers. And you can immediately measure crossover frequencies in this hybrid pollen. And, and such a pollen is depicted here. So this is a barley pollen nucleus uh, or barley pollen grain. Um, with, with a pollen coat around and inside you have the sperm and the so-called vegetative nucleus. These are the haploid outcomes of meiosis. However, the problem is they, they represent a very limited DNA content. And uh, so already some years ago in the lab of Andreas Huben here at the IPK for barley, it was developed to use instead of segregating population to really use pollen nuclei to measure meiotic recombination rate. So this could allow a breeder to check a certain combination and to predict how frequent this occurs in terms how many plants he would have to grow in the fields. So this is all based on isolating pollen grains from plants, then isolating the nuclei out of the pollen grains, and then use a flow cytometer, a fax machine, to isolate the individual nuclei, um, go into individual rails, and then due to the very limited DNA content, 
before it has been always used a whole genome amplification step to enrich the DNA from every individual haploid polynucleus. And then you can use this DNA, for instance, for cast marker genotyping, so to genotype along the chromosomes, or you can even perform single cell genome sequencing. However, this is a very also a low throughput and rather um, expensive procedure. So we asked if we could substitute this expensive whole genome amplification to increase the throughput and also to decrease the cost. And with this um, idea, we, we came up in contact with Stilla and also Jay started her PhD, whether we could use maybe crystal digital PCR to genotype individual haploid pollen nuclei. And with this, I would already like to basically thank the people. So all the people from the group, in particular Jun Jian. Then I would also like to thank Andreas Huben and um, also Jörg Fuchs for the flow cytometry help and for the initial setup of the project. I would like to thank various funding bodies, in particular the Federal Ministry of Education and Research and also the European Union, in particular the MICOM, the ITN network of Jay's funding. And uh, now I would basically hand over to Jay who will talk about her work using crystal digital PCR. And I can also say, if you want to know more or more the details, this has been recently also published in Plant Journal. Here's the link to the paper. So if you want to know even more details. And now I will switch over to Jay. Many thanks. So hi, I'm Yun Jian. I hope you can hear me well and see my screen as well. Okay, so we will from now on talk about what we actually did practically to measure myotic recombination rates in barley polynuclei by performing nucleus genotyping using crystal digital PCR. So since Stefan already introduced us what is meiosis, myotic recombination, and what we wanted to do, we can directly jump into uh, the point that we did. So what we did was that we selected two different polymorphisms between two different cultivars. We had barky and morex or barley cultivars. Um, we selected two SNPs, it could be indels also. And in hybrid polynucleus, we genotyped these two SNPs at the same time. And to do so, we need one allelic probe sets uh, that are designed for two, that are designed for each parental alleles, Morex and Barca, and each of the probe are labeled with FOM and hex color. And with these two uh, colors that are labeled for uh, same parental alleles in two SNPs, blue for Morex and green for Barca, we were able to measure the recombination rates in barley pollen nucleus. So with that strategy, what we actually did was that we collect the pollen of hybrid between two different cultivars. We isolate the pollen nuclei mechanically, and then we stain them with propidium iodide. That's why now they are in red color now. And then we flow sort them directly into digital PCR mix with fax system. And then we wrote, and then we load our samples into the sapphire chip, and then we. Um, run the genotyping assay with Nika geode and we scan the chip in PRISM3 and we analyze the data with crystal miner. Um, we were attracted to our uh, attracted to crystal digital PCR system because it provides uh, provides us to run three chips at one time and each chip has four chambers and each chamber can provide uh, up to 25,000 droplets. So in total, if this is working with our material, this was really, uh, this could provide us really high throughput genotyping assay. So this was the starting point of our um, connection to Stila technology. So, to figure out if this system is um, suitable for us at all with our barley pollen nuclei, we first checked if this, um, this system can encapsulate our barley pollen nuclei successfully. And uh, here you can see very initial results. So in this left picture, this is the actual scanned picture of one chamber after the crystal DPCR. And you can see that all these, all these um, droplets and all these white, um, 
lightning droplets that are positive, and this is how you are reading your uh, droplets that are positive or not. And in this magnified picture, you can also see that we were able to visualize our uh, pollen nucleus even after the thermocycling. So you do see this one uh, bright dot here inside of the droplet, and this is the pollen nucleus encapsulated and went through the thermocycling. So with that same strategy, um, after checking that our bodily pollen nucleus can be well encapsulated and can get to the uh, can can get the result of the genotyping assay, we selected four chromosomal intervals that we wanted to uh, check. We had two centromeric chromosomal intervals on chromosome one and three, and distal intervals on chromosome three. So we had four in total. And let's talk about the possible scenarios that we can get from one droplet. So if there was recombination between two SNPs, uh, one and two here, you will see uh, if there was recombination, you will see both blue and green colors or green and blue colors. And the fluorescence value that are emitting from one droplet are scanned in the in the prism three and analyzed in and they're represented in 2d dot plot here uh, between hex and farm color and all these droplet that are showing both blue and green color or green and blue color are represented in this red box here as a recombinant and um and if there was no recombination taking place between two snips you will see both green green or blue blue colors and all the droplets um, that has only green, green, and blue, blue colors are represented in green box and blue box here at the end of each axis because they had stronger green and blue uh, signals. And this is how we counted the, the number of non-recombinants and recombinants and get the percentage of recombinants from our sample. And um, after checking all this, all, all this system is suitable for us and we can work with our system, we wanted to optimize our uh, setup furthermore. So the first thing we checked was the encapsulation efficiency. And you can see in this first graph here, we flow sorted different numbers of nuclei in one chamber from 2000 to 6000. And uh, we counted the number of droplets with one encapsulated nucleus, which is what we wanted to see. And the red dots are the average number of actually observed number of droplets with single nucleus. And the blue dots are the predicted number of droplets with one encapsulated nucleus uh, calculated by Poisson distribution. And what we found out from this uh, optimization was that uh, if you have a look at this red dot here, we are successfully encapsulating a bit, a bit lesser than half of what we sorted in. So if we sort in 3000 polynuclei in one chamber, we are getting a bit lesser than 1500 successfully encapsulated as single polynucleus. And um, uh, uh, the, the, the actually observed number was a bit lesser than predicted number, but we were happy to see this because we are getting consistent encapsulation um, all through our test. And um, another interesting thing was that while we were checking our droplets in crystal, we observed that some droplets are accidentally encapsulating more than one nucleus. It could be two, it could be three in one droplet, but uh, three or four nuclei in one droplet is, is very, very rare. It's almost not existing. So um, I counted the number of droplets that had two nuclei encapsulated and also compare that with predicted uh, percentage, a predicted number of droplets that could encapsulate two nuclei. And again, um, the actually observed number of droplets with two encapsulated nuclei were drastically lower than the predicted number of droplets with two nuclei. Um, and um, as we were sorting these different numbers of nuclei from 2000 to 6000, we observed that 
as we are follow sorting higher number of polynuclei, uh, you know, from 2000 to 6000, we observed that average fluorescence value was decreasing, as you can see in this graph. And the problem of this decreasing uh, fluorescence value is that they are getting closer, closer, closer to the negative clusters. And at some point, they are all gathering all together. And it makes you very difficult to define what is what. You know, it could be very difficult. So uh, we wanted to see, we wanted to know what could be the reason for this decreasing fluorescence value. And uh, we assumed that it could be that increasing concentration of PBS sheet fluid uh, from our fax sorting machine could be the reason. So in the second uh, graph, you can see that um, this is the result where I ran just, uh, just random genotyping assay with genomic DNA with different concentration of PBS buffer, which is the sheet fluid. And uh, from here, I again confirm that uh, with the higher concentration of PBS buffer, the average fluorescence value is decreasing. So we concluded that the PBS buffer, increasing concentration of PBS buffer is the, 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 the playing factor for this decreasing fluorescence value. And we concluded that we cannot just, you know, flow sort our polynuclei continuously, endlessly to our chamber. So we needed to stop at some point. So considering this uh, inhibitory effect from PBS buffer and also this encapsulation efficiency, and also considering the number of polynuclei that we can get from one flower and all these things, we concluded at this point to sort in 3000 nuclei in one chamber in all further assays. So this is how we uh, uh, initially optimize our setup. And um, we also came to a point that we could do something with our template itself, which is the polynuclei. And you might assume that, uh, as, you can, as you can assume from the fact that we were able to see the polynucleus even after the thermocycling, they're quite rigid. They're quite rigid than fragmented genomic DNA. So it could be quite difficult for our PCR components to access our target in uh, polynuclei. So we came to an idea that we can maybe digest our polynuclei before the thermocycling. So we tested uh, to, to pre-treat our polynuclei with proteinase K and restriction enzyme. And from here, we concluded that restriction enzyme is improving the, the efficiency the most. So we were adding a uh, restriction enzyme to all the assays that we tested. And after optimizing all these systems and we were analyzing our data and we observed that there are some false positives that are falling into the recombinants that could hinder our um, accurate calculation for the percentage for, for the uh, Yes, accurate, accurate calculation. So what are the false positives? They are the droplets, as you can see here, that are positive in both FOM and HEX channels. So they are falling into this red box, the recombinant zone, but they had either zero nucleus or two nuclei. So, you know, in this case, you are not so sure anymore if you are getting uh, you know, the, the right signals from one single polynucleus. So I manually counted all these false positives and they are deducted from the starting point uh, before the calculation of the recombinants. And after deducting these false positives, we again saw something interesting. So while we were running the chambers with our hybrid barley polynuclei, we also had another chambers, uh, other chambers that had one-to-one -one ratio of parental polynuclei so that we didn't expect to see any recombinant uh, population. But even after uh, deducting false positives, we were still getting some recombinants from where we didn't expect to see anything. Um, and then I checked those droplets, these uh, the droplets in this gray box here in the crystal droplet. 
and then uh, they were both positive in FOM and HEX channel, and they only had one nucleus, so they were not false positives. So we named them noise, and we always also deducting them from our calculation. But we were wondering what could be the, the, the playing factor for these noise, noise, uh, noise droplets, where are they coming from? So we had some uh, theories. Uh, the first thing could be that from when, when the PRISM3 is scanning our chip, maybe sometimes uh, due to lower resolution, not always, but due to sometimes lower resolution, maybe we are not seeing all the nuclei that are encapsulated in one droplet. Maybe that is the, the, the reason for this noise. And another thing could be that DNA contamination coming from our mechanical uh, isolation of polynuclei. So to figure that out, we mixed our um, polynuclei suspension with calibration beads that we usually use for flow sorter. And then we just specifically define, specifically selected calibration beads into digital PCR mix and we run the assay. And if there was uh, some kind of DNA contamination is happening, they will go into the droplet together and we will see some kind of uh, positive droplet here. But we didn't see anything uh, at the end. So we only saw the calibration beads are beautifully encapsulated and we didn't, we didn't get any noise droplet. So we could eliminate the possibility of DNA contamination from our mechanical sorting, mechanical isolation. Um, another playing factor for noise could be that uh, sometimes, not always, but sometimes some allelic probes could work um, unspecifically and, you know, picking up the opposite, uh, opposite genotyping, opposite genotype. And this could be the reason of noise. But uh, anyway, the noise rate was very low. It, it's not really hindering our um, analysis and they were always deducted from our analysis. So after optimizing the system and figure out what are the false positive and the noise, we uh, measured repeatedly the myotic recombination rates within four chromosomal intervals in um, repeated number of plants. So you can see all these four chromosomal intervals in color blocks here. And uh, black dots are the average value of recombination rates measured from one plant. And the red dot are the average of all the measured plants. What, uh, what we were happy about this measurement was that they were quite consistent all throughout the uh, different plants. And they were also very similar to expected values. And we were able to measure at the end more than 42,000 polynuclei. So this was a very, very happy um, conclusion. And to confirm um, our measurements in pollen, in hybrid pollen, we genotyped genomic DNA of the offspring, and they're represented as a blue line here. And you can see that again, uh, the offspring recombination rates are again fitting to our measurements also. It's very similar. And it's also fitting to uh, expected value. So we were somehow feeling safe or happy about our uh, measurements. And um, another thing that we also did to confirm that we are reliably measuring or reliably using this system, we manipulated um, our recombinants. So what we did was that we found the offspring plants that had certain uh, genetic conformation between uh, two selected loci in pollen, and we mixed them with parental pollen nuclei with certain ratio and we expect we expected to see certain ratio of of uh, recombination population and uh, we concluded that we are getting what we expected to see and we are reliably measuring um, mitochondrial recombination rates and we are reliably using the system was the conclusion um, and to check if our setup our genotyping setup could be applied to other crop plants or Arbidopsis. We used uh, leaf nuclei of Arbidopsis and five 
different um, crop plants with different nuclear and genome sizes for encapsulation test. And here we again uh, compared the actually observed number of encapsulation and predicted number of encapsulation of single nucleus. And they were again showing similar tendency to our barley pollen nuclei encapsulation. And uh, they were also consistent. And also the number of droplets with two uh, nuclei encapsulation was again, uh, the actual observed number was drastically lower than the prediction. So this was again a happy conclusion. And uh, from here we, were, we concluded that our system could be applied to other crop plants and also Arbdopsis in further experiments. Um, and until now, I was talking about the results that I was getting from PRISM3 that, uh, that provides us to scan three colors in parallel. Um, but um, thanks to Scylla, we were able to test um, some results from PRISM6, which enables us to scan six colors uh, in parallel from FOM to ATO700. So what, is, what, what, what we expected from PRISM6 was that we could multiplex even further more. So until now, we were multiplexing uh, two SNPs in one droplet with two colors. But we came to an idea that we could multiplex four SNPs using four colors. So in here, I used uh, FOM rocks for one interval here and hex and sci five for another interval here. Um, and then I was successfully measuring uh, the recombination rates from interval one and interval two at the same time in a higher number. So this is the result from very pilot experiments. Um, I injected some chemicals into our barley plants to induce myotic recombination. Um, and compare them with not injected plants in same chromosomal intervals with four colors. And then uh, from here, I saw that chemical one was inducing myotic recombination and chemical two didn't. And in other chromosomal interval, uh, chemical one and two didn't do anything. But this was, this was all very interesting because uh, we just had to we just had to inject something, or you can stress your plants, or you can you can find your mutants, and then you can very fastly screening your targeted area in higher number of polynuclei. So, in summary, we uh, measured mitochondrial recombination in more than forty two thousand polynuclei uh, from two centromeric and two distal intervals, and we confirmed our measurements of recombination rates in hybrid pollen uh, by genotyping the offspring. And then we also checked that uh, nuclei from various plant species with different uh, nuclear and genomic sizes can be, can be used with, our, with a crystal GPCR genotyping system. And we also improved our genotyping efficiency with restriction enzyme treatment of polynuclei. And we also tested PRISM6 prototype to multiplex furthermore um, uh, that could provide, provide us higher sample throughput. And uh, lastly, I thank Biosystem and Chromosome Structure and Function team in IPK and all the technical support and applying support from Stila Technologies all these years. And thank you for your attention. For that very interesting presentation. I hope that the audience found it informative and were inspired. We'll now move on to the question and answer session. Simply hover over the Q&A tab and click to type in your questions. Okay, let's see the first question. What sheet fluid did you use for the sorting step? Who would like to answer that? Well, I think I can answer. Um, yes, the sheet fluid we use for sorting system was uh, the, the PBS buffer. Okay, thank you. The next question would be, could you adapt the system for other plants or even other non-plant specimen? Yes, um, as I said, we tested the leaf nuclei of other, uh, of five different crop plants and Arbidopsis. We only tested encapsulation in there, but uh, we had also opportunity to perform genotyping 
essay with Brassica, and this was also working very well. So I think it could be easily applied to other crop species. The next question is, uh, were you doing single droplet sorting? Single droplet sorting. Single droplet sorting. I, I'm not sure I, I'm, I'm getting the meaning of the question. I mean, I don't know if the question refers after the genotyping was done, if we tried to isolate again by the fax machine individual positive droplets. So if this request refers to this, this we haven't tried. Yes. No, okay, no, 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 you. we didn't, yeah. The next question is for Dr. Hackman. Um, could there be a possible natural mutation leading to a negative effect from the pollen used from the field? Um, I'm also not really sure about the question, but basically, I mean, um, if it refers to pollen, I mean, we have also compared using pollen or offspring population. It's very similar. There are sometimes some kind of segregation distortion. So certain regions are different. And for sure, um, recombination rates in pollen are also environmental sensitive. So if you would use, have, let's say, higher temperatures or so, pollen quality could be less or also recombination rates can be different. I hope this answers the question. Okay, thank you. And the next question is for Jay. How were the droplets counted, manually or digitally? Uh, he's referring to slide 14. Yes, um, you're seeing at slide 14. So, um, yes, they were firstly uh, digitally counted at first, but um, I was also checking them manually. Um, it sounds laborious, but it's not really laborious uh, because you can very easily see them under the uh, under the hex channel, and uh, it 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 doesn't yeah it it's very easy. They were manually and digitally checked. <laughs> Thank you. Just a reminder to all attendees: please uh, type in your question to the Q and A tab and not the chat tab, and that way we will be able to answer all your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, the next question. Were you using commercial PBS sheet fluid? If so, which one? Or did you prepare your own in the lab? I think it was homemade. Um, yeah, it, it was homemade. It was 1x PBS. Concentration was 1x. The next question is, did you combine proteinase K and Tech L? Did you use a different enzyme than Tech L? Why did you use Tech L? Um, yeah, I tried to combine proteinase K and tech, uh, tech one to, to go even further. Um, but the, the, if, if I can be honest, proteinase K was not really working really well in my hand. Um, it, it was giving uh, some inconsistent result and it was a bit laborious because you need to digest with proteinase K first um, and then resort them into the PCR mix. So I didn't really like it. And also, um, yeah, it, it was not giving consistent results. So I, that's why I didn't combine them. And the reason why I used Tech one was that uh, Tech one was first thermostable, so they can work in, you know, thermocycling temperature. And also Tech one is not cutting our amplicon. This is the most important thing when you're using uh, restriction enzyme in PCR. Um, yeah, so if you can find other restriction enzymes that are thermostable and not cutting your amplicon, you can use whatever enzyme you want, I think. Okay, thank you. So the next question is, can it be used in case of wheat? Wheat. One, wheat. I think so, yes. Yes. I, I haven't tried it, but I'm very sure you can use it. And it's for Jay as well on slide 17. Are the areas marked A, B, and C also non recombinant? On 17. On slide 17. Are the areas marked A, B, and C are also, also yes. non recombinant? Um, my screen is frozen. So I will, because actually I prepared the slides for these questions. And if you don't mind, I will stop 
sharing and I will restart this. Screen. Yes, perhaps try restart, uh, resharing your screen. I'm very sorry for this. No problem. Um, at all. Okay. So the, oh Jesus. So the cluster A and ABC, they are important and not important at the same time. So um, let's let's assume that out of out of all these four allelic probes that we used in one droplet, let's assume that only one hex for SNP2 worked. Then you have only one green signal, and in this case, that droplet will fall into A area. And if the other hex probe for SNP1 worked, then this droplet will also falling into the A zone. And same, if farm probe for SNP1 worked, then they will falling into the C box. And if the other farm probe for SNP2 worked, then they will falling into the C box. Right. This is so the droplets that are in A and C zones are the droplets that are not that that uh, not all these two SNPs were properly genotyped. So that's why I said they are not important. But what they are important about is that uh, when we are defining the recombinant uh, droplets in this two D dot plot here. We draw the line from the lowest and highest point of the A zone and the lowest and highest point of the C zone. And then we take the droplets that are only falling into the intercrossing region of these lines. And they are the true recombinants. I hope this explained clearly. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Another question, uh, what are the additional genotyping populations example in the figure on slide 13? Yeah, I think this is the same same uh, question. And uh, I forgot to say, but cluster B are the droplets that had either no, no pollen nuclei encapsulated, like empty droplet, or a droplet that had nucleus, but for whatever reason, all the allylic probes didn't work at all. So they are the negatives, the B clusters. Thank you. The next question is from Bihelu. Hi, Yunjay, a great presentation. Could you please share with us your techniques, chemicals to induce or increase meiotic recombination frequency? Well, uh, it's, uh, at this point, it's uh, difficult for us to share. I would say it's quite uh, confidential and uh, you might check on my thesis once it's done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. The next question is, is there a difference between generative and vegetative pollen nuclei considering their different nuclear morphology or compaction? Um, yes, since uh, vegetative and sperm nuclei are looking already different and uh we we also wanted to check if they you know if they have different efficiency then we can you know select the ones that are you know working better and uh i did some pilot experiments that i separated uh vegetative nuclei and sperm nuclei and we run them separately and from our pilot experiments um sperm nuclei showed much better uh, results than vegetative nuclei, but the fact, but the reason why we didn't uh, do this consistently was that we were not able to always get, you know, this vegetative and sperm nuclei distinguished perfectly. This is not always possible. This is very highly dependent on the quality of your pollen uh, sample, and um, yeah, because of, because of those reasons. We didn't, um, we just pull all together and then we run them. Thank you. The next question, why are the numbers of droplets containing two nuclei lower than expected? Um, I think we don't, we, we don't know the reason, but I could assume that uh, since the, the polynuclei are 
acting differently for sure to to genomic DNA. Or Stefan wants to add something? No, I basically agree, Jay. I mean, you have tested different nuclear size and you always observe the same so that you have a very low um, frequency. You also have tested also some fluorescent beads and there were similar results. So it looks like that a nucleus or a structure might behave different than nucleic acid typically used. So the last question for today, how individual nuclei were isolated from different pollen for this study? Um, well, the nuclear isolation was done uh, mechanically and uh, the, the method for isolation itself for all these different crop species was done in the same way. We, we just collect the pollen, we mechanically grind them, and then we filter them when, with certain sizes of mesh, and then we get the isolated pollen nuclei. So this was, this was very easy. And you can, if you want to see more detailed procedure, you can check my paper. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that was the last question. Uh, that's all the time we have for today, I guess. I'd like to thank Dr. Stefan Heckman and Yun Jae An for today's informative presentation and Q&A session. I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us online and for your interesting questions. I hope that you found this a worthwhile event. If you have any questions, please feel free to email Haley Lim at Haley at global-engage.com. Thank you very much and goodbye everyone. Thank you to Thank the speakers. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.